In a hole in the ground, there lived a hobbit. Not a nasty, dirty, wet hole filled with the ends of worms and an oozy smell, nor yet a dry, bare, sandy hole with nothing in it to sit on or to eat. It was a hobbit hole, and that means comfort. Hi there, everybody, and happy Hobbit Day. Today is September 22nd, and that means today is Bilbo and Frodo's birthday. Uh, the Hobbit has always held a special place in my heart uh, because it was the very first fantasy book that I ever read. Um, and ultimately, it's the book that led to me getting into gaming. Uh, not just as a hobby, but eventually as my career. So I thought today might be a, a good day to take a look at how I got into the industry and kind of give all of you out there some tips and advice uh, if you are interested in getting into uh, the gaming industry. So for me, it all started out back in 1986 uh, when I was in school and one of my English teachers assigned us to read The Hobbit. As a matter of fact, I still have my copy. It's right here. This is my original copy of The Hobbit. It's a 1975 Ballantine Books print uh, edition. And uh, that book, when it landed into my hands, it was the very first book that was ever assigned to me in school that I read before it was due, like by a lot. Like I finished the book in a week uh, and I had like a whole month to read it and write reports. Um, for me, that was, that was new. Uh, that was a first, especially out of a book that I had been assigned uh, uh, as part of school. So, um, you know, obviously, uh, The Hobbit is a foundational fantasy novel, uh, got me interested in fantasy. And when a friend of mine, Christopher, uh, offered, hey, why don't you come and play this game that I just picked up uh, uh, that has dwarves and elves and hobbits in it, uh, uh, I couldn't say no. So that was the first time I ever sat down to play Dungeons and Dragons uh, with the Menser era red box. Uh, my first character uh, named Falcon, poor Falcon, he died uh, hunting down Bargle uh, to a yellow mold covered dinner plate. The poor, poor bastard. Um, that next year, I went to Gen Con for the first time. I grew up in Milwaukee and uh, I went to Gen Con when I was just 11 in 1987. Uh, my dad dropped me off there uh, and didn't escort me around inside. I was 11. He left me and a friend of mine to wander the show by ourselves. It was kind of a different era, I guess. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, I think it all turned out okay. Uh, after that, I gamed on and off kind of uh, for the next decade or so. Uh, I played a lot of different games. I started out with D&D, but me and the friends that I eventually uh, found in high school that also gamed jumped around a lot. We played Battletech, we played Torg, we played Shadowrun, we played Call of Cthulhu, we played a lot of GURPS, we played Star Wars, we played Toon for a week, we played Amber, we played Vampire. We, we jumped around from game to game to game. The moment a new game came out and somebody picked it up, we were probably playing it a week or two later. Um, and really that foundation, that that start, that habit has stuck with me to today. I pick up new games um, habitually. When I see a new game come out, I, I, there's a decent chance I pick up the core book just to check it out. But as I grew up and got a little older, I kind of faded in and out of tabletop role-playing games a little bit in the in the mid-90s as I was starting to, uh, as I wrapped up high school and went into college, I got heavily into magic. I played a lot of Magic. I went to the, the first Pro Tour in New York. I was at a couple World Championships. I did pretty well. I nearly dropped out of tabletop gaming entirely uh, for a life of Magic. Um, but tabletop role-playing came kept drawing me back in. And really what did it uh, uh, to pull me back was the RPGA. I played a lot of RPGA uh, back in the in the 90s, uh, starting up with the the classic modules that they were running and uh, Living City. Living City was this new concept. It was organized play. You could make your own character and sit down at play at convention after convention uh, with a character that you created. That was that was new. 
And it was really exciting back then. It was crazy. There were certificates that you could trade back and forth representing all the items in the game. Um, and there was this whole, like, secondary economy in the Midwest of people trading certs back and forth. You know, you would go to shows and there'd be entire, entire tables dedicated to just cert trading. It was kind of a crazy time. I played a lot of Living City. And then Living Jungle when that came out. And Living Death. And so I played a lot of games, and I, I really played a lot of RPGA at Gen Con, at Origins, at Winter Fantasy, and I even started winning some tournaments too, and I started to think, you know, hey, I'm pretty good at this. I really like doing it. Uh, I met, I've met basically all of my friends through gaming, and uh, for me at that point in time, gaming was kind of my main hobby, my main thing, but even then, I never thought, you know what, I'm going to turn this into my career. That was never an idea that went through my head. At the time, actually, I was in college training to be an architect. And I ended up getting a degree and working in a firm for several years. But in 1999, the Living uh, uh, Greyhawk campaign was getting started. And the RPGA put out a call uh, for uh, volunteers to help with the campaign. And I applied and ended up getting a job uh, in the Wisconsin triad, we were running the region of high folk in Greyhawk. And from there, I met even more friends. I got involved deeper and deeper into the RPGA. And I met Eric Mona, who was one of the campaign administrators, uh, who in fact was one of the circle at the time. And he was one of the people who decided to hire me uh, to be a member of the Wisconsin triad. I started writing adventures then, a lot of adventures. I wrote dozens of RPGA scenarios for Living Greyhawk. I also started editing them. Other people would write them, I would edit and develop them. I was building a large skill set of uh, adventure skills uh, that I could use, um, you know, as in my own work to develop and uh, kind of enhance the work I was doing. So that rolled around for a few years. Eventually I got promoted into the circle, uh, but by then uh, Eric had split off to go uh, work more full-time on Polyhedron and eventually split from the company of wizards entirely to go join a fledgling company called Paizo. I was still on the circle and I ended up um, being the circle member for the IU's meta region. So I was coordinating Wisconsin and Illinois and Michigan and um, I think Australia and Texas, oddly enough. So I was kind of all over the place. And um, so I was then I really started writing a lot. At this point in time, I was being paid by uh, the RPGA to do the job. And uh, that was really kind of my first job in the game industry. Although I still was a, working full time as an architect, I was getting an, an annual pay uh, to develop and run all of these adventures. Uh, so the years rolled by and eventually uh, we get to 2004. And in 2004, uh, a position opened up uh, as a developer at Wizards of the Coast. And I had been doing this for several years now and felt pretty confident in my abilities. So I applied and I made it really far in the process. As a matter of fact, it came down to between me and one other candidate. And they went with the other guy. And he was at the company for years and did great work. But I was left without a job. I mean, I still was working in architect, but I didn't get a job in the game industry. But it was at around the same time that Paizo had an opening. And Eric, who I had known from Living Greyhawk, knew that I had just applied for a job at Wizards and had nearly gotten it. As a matter of fact, I had stayed with him uh, when I came out for my interview. And uh, he had an opening and I was a good fit. So in October 2004, I piled half of my worldly belongings into my beat up old car and drove all the way to Seattle and started as the managing editor of Dragon Magazine. Um, I held that job and held that position until the end of the print magazines uh, when Wizards brought those back in house. And uh, that was kind of the end of my tenure on Dragon, seeing it through to the end. <laughs> so after that, as Paizo was trying to find its way, I was 
managing the game mastery line. Uh, in the early days of Paizo, we had this line of accessories that we called the game mastery. And um, I was managing that line, doing maps and card packs and things like that. And as we got closer and closer to uh, the launch of 4th edition, there were some questions about whether or not we'd get to see a license and see the game in time. And it was around then that I had been developing a successor to 3.5 that I was just calling 3.75. And um, when Paizo was looking for a direction to go, I pitched my rules as a new version of the game. And that's how Pathfinder was born. Uh, and I mean, the rest is kind of history. I've been doing that for now 10 years, managing uh, Pathfinder through its entire first edition and the birth and launch of second edition. So, that's how I got in. So how do you get in? You've sat through me rambling for 10 minutes, so I suppose I should give you some of the secrets. The secret is, there really isn't a set path. I can't give you uh, a, a series of things that you can do and at the end you will definitely get a job in the game industry. That's just not how it works. If you talk to anybody in the industry, we all have different stories. There isn't a degree there isn't an apprenticeship. There isn't a set course that you can take to get into the industry. Each one of us has kind of our own meandering path. Some people were chemists. A lot of people had English degrees. Some people have math degrees. Some people have computer science degrees. It's, it's kind of all over the place. The game industry draws from a lot of different disciplines. But there are a lot of things that people in the game industry have in common. And I think if you do a lot of these things, you're putting yourself in the right skill set. You're giving yourself the right tools to make the jump if it's something you want to do. So first, rule number one, play games. Play games as much as you can. Board games, card games, video games, role-playing games. If it has the word game attached to it, you should give it a try. Go ahead, play it. See how it works. Deconstruct it. Figure out how all the pieces fit together. Two, write your own games. And when you're running games, write down what you're gonna run. Write your scenarios down. If you're running tabletop games, spend more and more time writing out the pieces that you're gonna uh, run. It gives you practice, it, it gives you confidence. It helps you deliver a better game experience to people at the table. And then when you're done running it, go back and review your work. See how it worked. Make corrections. Pretend as if you were going to run it again next time and make notes about what you would change, what you would do differently. These sorts of skills, this sort of practice that you can do kind of in a no-risk environment are really critical to building the foundational tool set you need to kind of work in gaming. Rule number three, tip play more games. Yeah, I know this is just like tip number one. But in this, I mean, play games even if you don't like them. Play the games that you look at and go, that game isn't for me. Especially go and play those games. Learn why they're not for you. Learn why they're aimed at someone else. Learn how they engage the audience they are targeted for. Pull them apart and understand what makes them tick and understand how some of those elements are not speaking to you. That's really critical. Being able to look at a game and understand that it's not for you will help you down the line when you're asked to design games that maybe aren't just for you. That's kind of next level. Understanding that not everything you make is for you, but you still have to make it and you still have to put yourself in the shoes of the people who want that product or that experience and you need to be able to deliver it. It's really important. Tip number four, explore what options are out there. You've been writing a lot for yourself and you're probably going to want to start looking on ways that you can start writing for others. There's a lot of different ways you can go. You can self-publish. PDF publishing these days and compatibility license and open game license make this easier than ever for you to sit down, write down some work, edit it together, and put it out there for people to use. It's easier than ever to do that kind of stuff all by yourself. Now, maybe you're not an artist. Maybe you don't need to know. Maybe you don't know how to do layout. Well, those can be some challenges, but there's a lot of resources out there. There are uh, places that sell stock art. 
that stock fantasy art that you can use in your PDFs. Layout can be done in Word. You could use a little practice and it doesn't hurt to kind of understand how some of these basic things, but there's also some really basic desktop publishing out there that'll give you some pretty decent results. It requires time and effort, but it's worth it. Also, there's other options too. You don't have to self-publish. You could work for or play. I did, worked great for me. Um, you could sign up to be a volunteer, help at shows, learn how to write scenarios, write for organized play. That's a great way to get experience in kind of uh, uh, an environment that is a little bit more forgiving to new writers. Um, and last but not least, and this is kind of the end of that chain, is start picking up freelance from publishing houses. Paizo certainly uses a lot of freelancers. That doesn't mean we necessarily have open calls. We have stables of freelancers that we use on a regular basis. And these are people that have been developed. They are people who have done a lot of work. We've seen their work in other places. We've met them at shows. They've been volunteers for us. And eventually they work their way into that cadre of people that we can assign work to and trust that they will deliver. Tip number five play all the games. I keep I keep repeating this because it really is that important. If you want to be in games, you have to be well versed in games. Keep going back to games. Go back to games that you played years ago. Take them apart, figure out how they work, figure out how they didn't work. That's always really useful to learn. Not just the games that you didn't like, but look at the games critically that you did like understand how those pieces function, how they made you have an enjoyable time, or how they enabled you to have an enjoyable time, uh, depending on the game, I suppose. Um, but learn from those mistakes. Learn from your own past games. At this point in time, you should be building up a library of bits and pieces. Being critical of your own work is an important skill. Being able to look back at the things that you've made in the past and understand what worked best in those and what you do differently now is critical. I can't tell you how many things I look back at from the early days of my career and go, whew, I don't know what I was thinking. Boy, that could have been better. So finally, step six, do it because you love it. Do it because it's what you want to do. Put all this effort in because you have a passion to do it, because you want to share your ideas with others. But there's one addendum to this, and this is an addendum that's really important, and I want everybody to hear it. Make sure you get paid. This is a job after all. The games in the game industry, a lot of people like to be, oh, it's it's all fun and games, you know, that's fine. You can you can work for real cheap. Don't devalue yourself. Put in the work, put in the hours, and get paid for your effort. Well, that's about all I got for today's uh, design musing. Uh, a little different than some of the previous ones, but I hope you enjoyed it nonetheless. I just wanted to say, once again, happy birthday, Bilbo and Frodo. I will uh, see you all uh, this coming Wednesday, where I think I might be talking about death and dying in games. I think that might be really fun, so tune back in Wednesday for that. Thank you for watching. Get out there and make some great games. Mm -hmm.